So welcome everybody who's with us tonight. Um, Teresa and I are really excited to kick off our partnership with Parent and Educator series. I think we're, we're getting um, you know some new participants, so we're really excited about that. Um, we're just really excited to kick off our new series this year with um, Margie Howells. I'll get to her in a minute, but I want to introduce myself first. I'm Sarah Sora. I'm the director of the Dyslexia Center and Learning Lab at the Campus Laboratory School, located on Carlo University's campus. And I am thrilled to um, work in collaboration with Teresa at Wheeling Country Day School, and I will let Teresa introduce herself. Um, yeah, hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. My name is Teresa Kalchek, and I am um, the Director of Literacy for EDGE, powered by Wheeling Country Day School. And um, this is Sarah and I. This is our first uh, kickoff for the year uh, for our, our parent speaker series. So last year, we had several. We had about 10 of these uh, webinars, and they are on each of our sites. Um, and in the chat box, I will definitely put our link and Sarah can add hers so that you can visit any of those pre-recorded sessions that we've had um, last year. So this is our first one this year. We're going to, we have one more, uh, we have one scheduled for October and one scheduled for November. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll make sure that that gets out on social media and um other platforms that you'll that you can get more information about more of our um our webinars so welcome everybody sarah if you want to introduce our special guest today i am honored to introduce our special guest today our special guest is margaret howells she is the edge math director and fourth grade classroom teacher at willing country day school located in willing west virginia she has worked extensively with struggling math students in the regular classroom and in after school tutoring. Margie has attended various workshops to learn ways to identify and assist students with dyscalculia, including the multisensory and Orrin Gillingham influenced approaches of Ron Yoshimoto and Marilyn Zecker. Margie was the West Virginia awardee for the 2016, 2016 Award in Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. She's a graduate of West Liberty University and has over 30 years experience in the field of education. Um, and I'll just say that we at um, the Campus Laboratory School are so um, honored and excited and um, to have Margie work with us and our third grade teacher, Grazia Curatolo, um, on a math pilot program for third graders. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Margie. Well, hello there, and thank you for that introduction. That was very nice. Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy that you joined us tonight, and I'm really excited to share with you everything that we've been doing at Wheeling Country Day School through our EDGE program to develop a structured math curriculum. I've put together a slide deck that I'd like to share with you that I can kind of walk you through our program and what we've been doing. So let me start that. Okay, here we go. So first of all, I'd like to give you a little history about our journey at Wheeling Country Day School, addressing students with learning differences. Um, several years ago, we started noticing lots of struggling learners coming through our school, and subsequently we started the Center for Multisensory Learning. We called it the CML. And the CML addressed these learning differences with, of students that you see on your screen. For the most part though, the CML focused on students with dyslexia or other reading related um, disabilities. The CML and its staff, the leadership and all used the Orton Gillingham approach for structured literacy in working with their students. So, Orton Gillingham is a structured literacy approach that's built on these four principles. It's systematic, it's cumulative. I didn't want to read all the descriptors to you. You can read those. It's explicit in its instruction and it's multi-sensory. 
OG was not only used in the CML, but in our classrooms as well. We as classroom teachers, myself included, attended training sessions where we learned to use the structured literacy approach in our regular classroom, and it became part of our literacy curriculum. However, 2020 came along and our students and students all over the globe had to, to pivot to virtual learning. At, C at WCDS, we were pretty much able to seamlessly um, become teachers over the, over the internet or virtual learning. But there were some problems, there were glitches, but we came through it finding that we had strengths we didn't know we had. We navigated this new landscape and additionally, we took on new, a new challenge to teach and learn with students not in our classrooms and not even in our community. We embarked on an out of school time virtual teaching model, beginning with a partnership with the Boys and Girls Club in Benton Harbor, Michigan. This is a photo of one of our tutors with a student from Benton Ar Harbor. And you can see that our motto was teach is still teach differently, teach fearlessly, learn differently, learn fearlessly. So we were all afraid. Everyone was afraid when we had to become virtual teachers. We didn't know exactly how to pull this off, but we came up with that fearless um, mindset. So our, uh, let's see. Our tutoring in, uh, with the school focused on literacy skills. And soon we began asking, what about math? In my 30 years of teaching, I've always had a heart for struggling students and particularly math students. In my after school tutoring and in my classrooms, I was always on the lookout for ideas and techniques and curricula and things like that that I could use to help my students become fluent with math, but also to see math in a different way. So I, I was on a quest to learn about different resources. And I was joined my, by my colleagues. Several of us went off and studied in the multi-sensory techniques, like um, Sarah mentioned, with Ron Yoshimoto and Marilyn Zecker. And along the way, we learned lots of things. One of the things I learned was about dyscalculia. I also learned how to pronounce it. It's a difficult one. <laughs> and dyscalculia is a specific, specific and persistent difficulty in understanding numbers, which can lead to a diverse range of difficulties with mathematics. And we've all seen students in our classrooms or in our homes that are struggling with mathematics. So I wanted to share with you maybe some what you might see if you have uh, some signs and symptoms of dyscalculia. So first of all, students who struggle with math and particularly students who have this type of dyscalculia have trouble early on in their lives with counting particularly counting one-to-one -one correspondence or understanding what the number three represents and so forth. Um, children with this country, they have trouble counting forwards and backwards. Those can be especially difficult, the backwards counting. Uh, also, students with dyscalculia have some trouble distinguishing between quantities for symbols. For instance, the, let, the number six and the number nine, which is greater, which is less than. And in math, we have symbols like the greater than and less than symbol, and those can also cause a lot of confusion for students with dyscalculia. Word problems and story problems are, are especially difficult as well, especially when you have to think five and eight, which is bigger, which is smaller. Another struggle that students with dyscalculia have are learning their math facts. This is especially difficult for students in third and fourth grade who are starting to learn their multiplication facts. Students also struggle with, multi, uh, with mental math and doing problem solving in their mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
um, students with dyscalculia can have trouble figuring out patterns or finding patterns, looking at patterns. And since, as I tell my students, math is all about patterns, this creates a very big difficulty for them. Students can have trouble with left and right orientation or spatial reasoning, like <clears throat> the picture that you see there where you have to flip the shape in your mind and decide what it will look like. That can be especially difficult. Um, students can have trouble telling time or counting money. And they can have trouble subitizing, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So when you look at this slide and all of the myriad of things that our brains have to do to understand math, it makes a lot of sense that students with a math disability will have a lot of struggles. Um, now I'd like to go back to comparing dyslexia and dyscalculia because a lot of times um, children who have one may have the other. And dyslexia and dyscalculia are actually the, about the same amount of prevalence. You will have the, about three to five percent of the children may have dyslexia or dyscalculia. So students with dyslexia will start to talk late. Students with dyscalculia will start to count late. Students with dyslexia have trouble blending and segmenting sounds, whereas students with dyscalculia have trouble composing and decomposing numbers. So both of these skills have to do with bringing things together and breaking them apart. In dyslexics, they have a hard time with rhyming patterns. And in dyscalculia, there's a problem with number patterns, as I mentioned earlier. Discal uh, dyslexics read letter by letter or word by word, and dyscalculics will count tally marks by one by one very slowly, both of these having to do with being able to see a larger chunk together and bring meaning out of it. They forget sight words. They forget math facts. These students struggle with grammar. These students struggle with algorithms, such as processes used in... Uh, multiplication, or in addition with regrouping, or subtraction with regrouping, remembering that process of how to solve that problem and how to go through the process. Um, dyslexics can copy letters out of order, and dyscalculics can copy numbers out of order. Dyslexi dyslexics can forget dates, names, and addresses, and dyscalculics can forget logins, numbers, and deadlines. So I thought this was an interesting graphic to show. Well, here we are now. Now we are starting on this new fearless journey. We are embarking on uh, developing and we're currently piloting our structure math counterpart. We're working on building this so that we can use it in out of school time tutoring as well as in school based tutoring. And the photo that you see on the screen is a picture of some of the students that I work with at the Carlo Lab School. We um, work twice a week and uh, we do this over the computer so it's a virtual uh, delivery. So when I was given the charge to lead this and try to come together with building a structured math curriculum, I felt like this octopus. I had all of these different things that I had learned and best practices that I had read about and studied. And I was trying to figure out how can we pull this all together to make something that's structured for children and for teachers to be able to deliver. So my colleague, Laura Demarest and I got together and we talked a lot about how should we begin. And we decided we've got to stick with the structured literacy approach. We've got to stick with this structured approach and use the systematic, the cumulative, the explicit, and the multi-sensory when we build our curriculum. We also decided that we've got to put the principles into practice. So we have to incorporate visual, auditory, and tactile elements into our lessons. And we have to build starting at the concrete level then the representational, and finally to the abstract when we teach our students. We came up with some goals 
We had six goals. We want to build number sense and math fact fluency. That's the first one and the most important one, I believe. We want to use auditory, visual, and tactile elements in our lessons. We want to teach math processes explicitly through direct instruction. And we want to work on grade level skills so students gain confidence in the classroom. I always had a heart for students who felt um, who didn't feel confident in the math classroom. So I wanted, and Laura and I talked about this, we wanted those students to get something from our lessons so that when they go back into the classroom, they do have a sense of confidence built in. Uh, another goal was that we wanted to systematically and cumulative review previous skills and introduce new ones. And overall, we have wanted to create this so that it could be delivered either over a virtual network or in person. So those were our goals. And we worked together this summer and we started writing the curriculum and we started building um, student materials. What you see on the screen in front of you is the student materials binder that we took to our two schools that we're piloting with. And um, I'll show you. So every student received a binder, looks like this, and a materials box. And behind me, I have one of the materials that the kids really love. And it looks like an abacus. It's called a wreck and wreck. And it is from the Dutch language, which means counting rack. So we use this a lot. Um, we've been developing lessons to use that. But I'd like to show you one of our lessons. So here is the beginning of one of our lessons. This is lesson three that Laura and I have been working on, and we've actually actually delivered this lesson. Um, on the first slide, we have notes for the teacher, and you will see that our curriculum has those elements like we set out that we wanted to use. We wanted to use auditory or visual visual tactile. We wanted to introduce new material, and we wanted to have the students produce something or practice. Each one of our lessons comes along with a script that tells us, it reminds us when we get into teaching our lesson, how the lesson is to flow. And eventually the idea is that someone else would be able to pick this up and teach this lesson, having the slide deck and then having this lesson outline. So you can see that the first slide is the auditory drill. And we've even got some notes in here about how we want to deliver that, for instance, face-to-face. -face. And we decided that beginning face-to-face -face was important for our students, especially over the virtual network, that we would be able to connect with them. Let me go ahead and back to my presentation and show you. After we do our auditory drill with the kids, we're doing a lot of counting we will do a visual drill. Our students learned all of the partners to make five, and now this is just a little quiz. We ask them, if this makes five, what's missing? So the students tell us four. So we just play this little visual game with them so that they can practice making five. And then we start doing some kind of visual tactile um, lesson. And here we have nine cards with nine dots on each one. And the students needed a crayon and all this was in their materials pack. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what we do is we started just coloring in the dots as you would for dice so that the children would just replicate the dice pattern for these. I'll just go ahead and flip through those a little bit quickly, but you can see that we've got the usual dice pattern. And then I usually tell the kids that six is the, uh, the last one that we usually see on a dice or die. We don't always see seven on a die, but it's just six with one in the middle and eight is six with two. And then they count by threes to do the nine. Once they make these cards, then we talk about subitizing. 
this was the lesson for this time. And it was subitizing. And subitizing means being able to tell the number of things in a set just by looking at them. You don't have to count them one by one. So one of our goals is to help children to recognize quantities without having to count one by one, just like we're always trying to get them to, instead of counting out on your fingers, being able to subitize an amount. So we we'll, we show the kids that you can tell, you can subitize. And they tell us, we ask them, how many do you see? And they automatically say two and four and three. So I tell them, great job subitizing. And then we talk about how important it is to try this. Oh, no, wrong one. Uh, then we talk about how it's easier to subitize when things are in a pattern, like the dice pattern that you see here, rather than in an array that's not all lined up. And they can still subitize, though. They still are surprised that they're, that they're so good at subitizing five and then a little mixed up array of five as well. And then we talk about when a, a number is higher than six, it's a little harder to subitize. When you see a cluster of things higher than six, it's a little harder. So what you have to do is you have to break apart, subitize and break apart. So for instance, you might see three across the top and then five. So you know three and five is eight. Or probably easier is telling them to find the six and then the two, and six and two is eight. Um, I encourage my kids to try subitizing when they go home or go to the soccer field or are sitting down to dinner. Look over your dinner table and see if you can subitize how many cups there are or how many pairs of shoes are on the floor. And here is how many soccer players are there. And they see right away three. And here they have to subitize how many soccer players. This is a little bit harder because there's a guy back there that shouldn't be there. So, but we still have five. And then again, they practice with this picture. And then we talk about subitizing this big group of soccer players. It would be difficult to count those as one big group. But if we divide it in half and we see four on this side and five on this side, we know we've got nine. So they subitize that. And then we organize and clean up. So that's a rundown of how one of our structured math lessons go. goes. Let me see, pull you back up here. And I just, I wanted to share that with you so you could see what it looked like. And we deliver our, um, we deliver our curriculum virtually. And here's um, some students from Waterville Primary School in Waterville, Ohio. And there's me using my Rec and Rec and teaching um, virtually. And we also deliver in person. And this is my colleague, Laura, I talk for, uh, teaching her. Are you going to show me partners? Show me 10. Show me one and nine. Just on that talk for uh, Show me one and nine. How many did you have to move over to show me one and nine? Oh, um, one. Just one. Well, you, you can put nine over. That's fine. There you go. Okay. Show me two and eight. Two. With only one move, show me two and eight. One. There you go. There's just a little clip of Laura doing her thing. Now, how do I get out of it? <laughs> I didn't think about this part. Top row. Oh, nope. We're gonna, you're gonna show me partners oh, me ten. Show me one and nine. Just on that top row. Show me one and nine. Huh. My computer is not responding to me clicking the full screen button. Technical difficulties. Okay, let me see. Top row. Oops, nope. We're gonna, so, you're gonna show me partners me. Sorry about that. <laughs> little glitch. Okay, so you may have some questions now. You may be thinking, does my child need structured math? Does your child have a persistent difficulty with math or 
do they sometimes just struggle with a certain skill? That will be something to consider. Every child learns at their own pace, a different pace. Uh, one student may get addition and have trouble with rounding. One student may get subtraction with regrouping, which is difficult, but may fly through fractions. So um, it, that's what we want to think about. Is it a persistent difficulty or is it more or less a skill that they're having trouble with? Um, can structured math help the children in your care? Um, structured math can help students build a stronger, found, a stronger foundation and more fluent for higher level skills. And then I'd like to just talk a little bit how about how can you support your child at home? Get back there. So try this at home. So first of all, Pract uh, practice math facts in fun ways. Make it a game. For instance, you could try this game called Cougar Math. And this is something that we play at school and we use flashcards. So if you have some flashcards at home, this would work just great. So the reason that we call it Cougar Math is because we are the Wheeling Country Day School Cougars. But you could choose any fast animal. You have your child think about a fast animal, the fastest animal they like, and then a slow animal. So for instance, here's our cougar. And then our slow animal is the sloth. And then we think about a, an animal that speed is somewhere in between and we decided on a monkey. So what we try to do here is we encourage the children to know that math fact within four seconds. If you hold up that math fact and the student knows it within four seconds, that card goes in the cougar pile. If it takes them you know, a little more than four seconds, we're gonna put it in the monkey pile. And finally, if it has, if your student has to maybe even count out the answer on their fingers or something like that, that would be in the sloth pile. And once you go through all the cards, say 10 to 20 cards, you take the cards in the cougar pile and you take them out of the game because your child has shown that they know those cards. And then you go through the the ones that are left over, and you do it again for sloth, monkey, and cougar until they actually get all of them out of the deck. So you could start with, like I said, 10 to 20 and work on those for a few nights or a few days until they've been able to successfully cougar out all of those and then start with a new set of new cards. Another uh, suggestion that I have is to get nosy. And what I mean by that is get nosy into um, your student, your child's um, day at school or what they're doing in school in math. Maybe your child has a textbook that they bring home or um, assignments that they bring home where you can kind of see what they're working on at school and then use the internet and find different kind of manipulatives that you can use at home. I know it's it's hard because um, not all of us are teachers, but I think that um, looking on the internet, we can find things that we can use in our own homes. For instance, I love the one with the pasta being used for acute and obtuse angles. And then of course the plate for fractions. And if your child is working on money at school, maybe try something like the little egg with money inside of it, or just counting money together. Whatever they're doing at school, if you can focus on that at home and just give them, you are the, a great teacher because that's your child and you love your child so much that you can reach them and you can explain things to them in ways that you know they'll understand. So give that a try too. Um, use all kinds of objects for math manipulatives. Anything can be a math man manipulative. These are just some water bottle lids. They can be counters. Um, one time I was teaching a student improper fractions to mix numbers. And we had some of these in the classroom left over. And I took one of uh, two of them, I cut them into four pieces so that I had four eighths or eight fourths, sorry. So I had eight fourths and the student was able to see eight fourths is two whole, two whole, you know, uh, a number two. So 
it was just real simple and real quick. And uh, there are just things all around you that you can use with your child. Uh, this is a photo of one of our students at school. And on the left are the base 10 blocks. And every school has base 10 blocks. But maybe at home you don't have base 10 blocks, but you have popsicle sticks or something that you can bind together like this little child is doing here. She's got groups of 10 popsicle sticks instead of the base 10 blocks, but it works the same way where she can understand putting those together to make 10 and breaking them apart to make ones. Some children, when they're learning subtraction, need to work the problem out with base 10 blocks or manipulatives at the same time that they do it on paper so that they can see what's happening. For instance, base 10 blocks show the child that you have taken away one 10 and now you have 13 ones. So they need to see that, but they also need to work it out in writing as well so they can see it and do it. Playing board games is wonderful. Um, for early childhood children, they learn to subitize. Any young child that's played a lot of board games can look at a dice that has five on it and say five, or look at a three and say three. And then soon they'll start to, co to compose those together, a five and a three, that's always eight, no matter what, because you've learned that from playing the board games. Play card games such as Go Fish. Now, if you play Go Fish, I recommend not using cards that just have matching pictures, but use real cards so that students start to recognize numbers and quantities, and they start to understand matching and sorting. They've got auditory and memory skills that they're working in, working in there too. Now, for older children, you could bump it up to doubles addition. So not only do I have a pair of, do I have sixes and I get to lay them down, but I can say six plus six is 12. I can do all of my doubles. And if you use the face cards, you can do all of the doubles up to 13 plus 13. For older children, if you really want to give them a boost, have them play for square numbers. So if they get two sixes, they have to tell that that is six times six is 36. And instead of asking for us, do you have a seven? They have to say, do you have the square root of 49? So they get to understand square roots right away, very um, early on. Play tens go fish. This is a wonderful um, variation of go fish. Knowing the partners to make 10 is so very important for young students young children. So playing, instead of asking for, do you have a pair? Do you have two cards that will make 10? If I have a two, then I know I need to ask for an eight. So this is another uh, great way to play a game. And then make time in the car count by counting. So spend that time counting with your child. So for instance, some of the easiest counting is where you can do counting by ones. So maybe you leave the house and you count by ones back and forth, one, two, or however many people you have in the car. And you say, we're going to count until we get to such and such a landmark. Um, but you don't want to count all the way if it's a long trip. And then the next day, pick it up from that same number that you left off so that your child has and experience counting into hundreds, two hundreds, and so forth. So all of that practice is good. And then try doing it backwards. So instead of starting at one, let's start at 100. And a little bit harder would be to have your child count by twos, fives, and tens, again, forward and backward. And even more challenging would be to have your child start counting by tens at any number. So say, 33. Can you count by tens starting at 33? So it would be 33, 43, 53, 63. How about backwards? Start at 74, 64, 54. A lot of times children don't realize that they are actually adding 10 and subtracting 10. So you might say to, to a child, what is 32 plus 10? And they're wanting to count that out instead of thinking 
it's just one more 10. I'm just going to increase the number in the tens place by one. And then this is a fun way to practice um, different ways of counting. It's called cross counting. And it's where you have children, we mix it up. And here's a little video of me doing it with a group of students. So I'll get ready. Have we counted by ones? Have we counted by twos? Have we counted by fives? Yeah. Have we counted by tens? Yeah. All right, so today I want to mix it up a little bit. And I've got some big cards that I want to hold up. And what's that? Those are big. They are big, aren't they? They're like as big as my face. So the first card is an ace and it stands for one. And then I have a two. Could I have you looking up here, please? And then I have a two, a five, a 10, and then look at this card. Can you see that card? Yeah. What does it say? Can you read what it says at the top? Pause. Pause. So that means stop, okay? So Evelyn, will you start counting by ones? Just start at one. Two, three, four, five, six. Oh, look, Evelyn. Six. So you pause at six. Now, Olivia, I want you to pick it up and start counting by twos. Eight. So we were at six. Eight. Nice. 10. Yep. 12. Good. 14. Yep. 16, 16, 20. Pause. All right. Now, the next person is going to pick it up. Natalie, you're going to pick it up and count by fives. So Olivia stopped at 20. Twenty. Twenty-five. Yep. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say you stopped at sixty. Okay, because I put it up and you didn't see it. All right, so we're at sixty, and now Remy. You're going to pick it up from there and count by tens. Okay. Now, Kason, you're going to pick it up and count backwards by ones, starting at 100. 100, 9, 9, 9, 8, 9, 7, 9, 6, 9, 5, 9, 4, 9, 3, 9, 1, 80, 9, 90, 90. Okay, that was cross counting. Why am I having such trouble with this? <laughs> okay, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing there because my last slide was just to say, get involved with multisensory um, structured math. And um, if you have any questions that I could answer, I'd like to answer any questions that you might have. Anybody has any questions or any comments about our structured math? I'll make a comment. Sure, go ahead. Uh, just having been a tutor um, of kids with dyslexia for so long, I noticed so many times that I really needed to help them with math. And I really didn't know where to start, but I knew that because the structured reading worked so well, multimodal, um, you know, the auditory 
and the tactile, it works so well. I knew that there would be a, there should be a way to do that with math, but I just didn't, I didn't know how to do it. So I am absolutely blown away and amazed by this. Um, I see it working with our kids at the campus school and it's just, it's amazing. Um, and I just, you know, I looking at those slides, um, comparing dyslexia and dyscalculia. Oh, I'm saying it wrong. Dyscalculia. dyscalculia. <laughs> um, was, that was so eye opening for me. Mm -hmm. um, both that slide and then the slide that showed how many different struggles kids with having math, because I have that same slide for kids you know, in reading and it's just, oh, yeah. this is so, um, it really was so um, educational and, and eye-opening for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm gonna check the chat. Oh. Yeah, Erica said she appreciated the examples um, and demonstrations because it gave her a better idea about how to help um, and that's so true. You do need those little tips and things you can do at home and in the car. Yeah. Um, they're so important, you know, and I always refer it back to reading or connect it back to reading, but you know, that's what we do too with the phonological piece. Um, so those were really great tips. Thanks. Anybody yeah. else? Thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you. It was really helpful, like all the tips and tricks. I mean, like like the one um, as Sarah mentioned, the counting in the car. We do that already, but all the different ways um, of doing it and getting some different ideas that was really helpful. And also maybe some of the materials when they come home, like you said, get nosy. Like I, I try <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Sometimes I feel bad because I'm like, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how that, can that you help your really... child if you don't know what what they're right. working on? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, so that was really helpful to kind of get that explanation to some of the materials because then you can can help much better mm -hmm. um, when you have that a little bit more of that that background knowledge. So thank you very much. I appreciate oh, that. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. My dogs are going crazy, but I also wanted to say um, the, card <laughs> games too. the card games were really great to see. Um, and I'm going to visit my niece this weekend who I know struggles in math. Mm -hmm. um, and she's in second grade. So I'm definitely going to play some of those games with her. Great. That's great. Um, if you are uh, Wheeling Country Day related, um, we have a website. Well, I have a website it's, uh, and I have a page on there for math that has some math things, um, more suggestions and things like that. And um, I can send that if you, how would that be the best to do that? Um, to send that information. Um, well, you know what, I, it's just, it's mhouse.weebly.com. Do you wanna put it in the chat, Margie? Yeah, see, that's good, you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And while you're doing that, um, Stephanie said she's been in education for 15 years and learned something new tonight. So did I, Stephanie. Mm. That was really amazing. Yeah. Let me put that in. Okay. And while she's putting that in, if you, anybody too wants to, um, I put our website in the chat so you can go back and look at some former workshops. And I don't know if Teresa did that before she left, but, um, let me take a check. No, she didn't, but I have it here okay. as well. That's Great. what I was going to say. Our our uh, site where we have it hosted is in the, literally right now in the midst of a big upgrade and, and relaunch. So um, if it's not there this evening, it'll be there by, by the morning. It should be up and ready to roll. So I'll put that Great. in the chat as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, I really appreciate everyone uh, coming out and uh, listening to my spiel. Uh, and I'm, you know, just so excited about the work that we're doing. And I, I'm very hopeful that it will help the students that we're working with and then continue to help even more students. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Margie, for Welcome. presenting for us. That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you at the next one, we hope. All right. Thanks, Sarah. Good night, everyone. Good night.